Robert Walpole, 1st Earl of Orford, was a British statesman and Whig politician who is generally regarded as the de facto first Prime Minister of Great Britain. Although the exact dates of Walpole's dominance, dubbed the Robinocracy, are a matter of scholarly debate, the period 1721-1742 is often used. He dominated the Walpole Townsend Ministry, as well as the subsequent Walpole Ministry, and holds the record as the longest-serving British Prime Minister in history. W. A. Speck wrote that Walpole's uninterrupted run of 20 years as Prime Minister is rightly regarded as one of the major feats of British political history. Explanations are usually offered in terms of his expert handling of the political system after 1720, his unique blending of the surviving powers of the Crown with the increasing influence of the Commons. Walpole was a Whig from the gentry class who was first elected to Parliament in 1701 and held many senior positions. He was a country squire and looked to country gentlemen for his political base. Historian Franco Gorman says his leadership in Parliament reflected his reasonable and persuasive oratory, his ability to move both the emotions as well as the minds of men, and, above all, his extraordinary self-confidence. Hoppet says Walpole's policies sought moderation, he worked for peace, lower taxes and growing exports and allowed a little more tolerance for Protestant dissenters. He mostly avoided controversy and high-intensity disputes as his middle way attracted moderates from both the Whig and Tory camps, but his appointment to Chancellor of the Exchequer after the South Sea Bubble stock market crisis drew attention to a perceived protection of political allies by Walpole. H. T. Dickinson sums up his historical role by saying that Walpole was one of the greatest politicians in British history. He played a significant role in sustaining the Whig Party, safeguarding the Hanoverian succession, and defending the principles of the Glorious Revolution. He established a stable political supremacy for the Whig Party and taught succeeding ministers how best to establish an effective working relationship between Crown and Parliament. Scholars rank him highly among all British Prime Ministers. Chapter 1 – Early Life Walpole was born in Houghton, Norfolk in 1676. One of nineteen children, he was the third son and fifth child of Robert Walpole, a member of the local gentry and a Whig politician who represented the borough of Castle Rising in the House of Commons, and his wife Mary Walpole, the daughter and heiress of Sir Geoffrey Burwell of Ruffham, Suffolk. Horatio Walpole, first Baron Walpole was his younger brother. Chapter 2 education and early business success. As a child, Walpole attended a private school at Massingham, Norfolk. Walpole entered Eton College in 1690 where he was a King's Scholar. He left Eton on 2 April 1696 and matriculated at King's College, Cambridge on the same day. On 25 May 1698, he left Cambridge after the death of his only remaining elder brother, Edward, so that he could help his father administer the family estate to which he had become the heir. Walpole had planned to become a clergyman but as he was now the eldest surviving son in the family, he abandoned the idea. In November 1700 his father died, and Robert succeeded to inherit the Walpole estate. A paper in his father's handwriting, dated 9 June 1700, shows the family estate in Norfolk and Suffolk to have been nine manors in Norfolk and one in Suffolk. As a young man, Walpole had bought shares in the South Sea Company, which monopolized trade with Spain, the Caribbean and South America. The speculative market for slaves, rum and mahogany spawned a frenzy that had ramifications throughout Europe when it collapsed. However, Walpole had bought at the bottom and sold at the top, adding greatly to his inherited wealth and allowing him to create Houghton Hall as seen today. Chapter 3 – Early Political Career Walpole's political career began in January 1701 when he won a seat in the English general election at Castle Rising in Norfolk. He left Castle Rising in 1702 so that he could represent the neighbouring borough of Kings Lynn, a pocket borough that would re-elect him for the remainder of his political career. Voters and politicians nicknamed him Robin. Like his father, Robert Walpole was a member of the Whig Party. In 1705, 
Walpole was appointed by Queen Anne to be a member of the council for her husband, Prince George of Denmark, Lord High Admiral. After having been singled out in a struggle between the Whigs and the government, Walpole became the intermediary for reconciling the government to the Whig leaders. His abilities were recognized by Lord Godolphin, and he was subsequently appointed to the position of Secretary at War in 1708, for a short period of time in 1710 he also simultaneously held the post of Treasurer of the Navy. Despite his personal clout, however, Walpole could not stop Lord Godolphin, and the Whigs from pressing for the prosecution of Henry Sacheverell, a minister who preached anti-Whig sermons. The trial was extremely unpopular with much of the country, causing the Sacheverell riots, and was followed by the downfall of the Duke of Marlborough, and the Whig party in the general election of 1710. The new ministry, under the leadership of the Tory Robert Harley, removed Walpole from his office of Secretary at War but he remained Treasurer of the Navy until 2 January 1711. Harley had first attempted to entice him and then threatened him to join the Tories, but Walpole rejected the offers, instead becoming one of the most outspoken members of the Whig opposition. He effectively defended Lord Godolphin against Tory attacks in parliamentary debate, as well as in the press. In 1712, Walpole was accused of venality and corruption in the matter of two forage contracts for Scotland. Although it was proven that he had retained none of the money, Walpole was pronounced guilty of a high breach of trust and notorious corruption. He was impeached by the House of Commons and found guilty by the House of Lords, he was then imprisoned in the Tower of London for six months and expelled from Parliament. While in the Tower he was regarded as a political martyr, and visited by all the Whig leaders. After he was released, Walpole wrote and published anonymous pamphlets attacking the Harley Ministry, and assisted Sir Richard Steele in crafting political pamphlets. Walpole was re-elected for King's Lynn in 1713. Chapter 4, Stanhope Sunderland Ministry Queen Anne died in 1714. Under the Act of Settlement 1701, which excluded Roman Catholics from the line of succession, and was succeeded by her second cousin, the Elector of Hanover, George I. George I distrusted the Tories, who he believed opposed his right to succeed to the throne. The year of George's accession, 1714, marked the ascendancy of the Whigs who would remain in power for the next fifty years. Robert Walpole became a privy councillor and rose to the position of paymaster of the forces in a cabinet nominally led by Lord Halifax, but actually dominated by Lord Townsend and James Stanhope. Walpole was also appointed chairman of a secret committee formed to investigate the actions of the previous Tory ministry in 1715. Lord Oxford was impeached, and Lord Bolingbroke suffered from an act of attainder. Lord Halifax, the titular head of the administration, died in 1715 and by 1716 Walpole was appointed to the posts of First Commissioner of the Treasury and Chancellor of the Exchequer. He was a member of the Board of General Officers established in 1717 to investigate the abuse of pay. Walpole's fellow members, appointed by the Prince of Wales, included William Pulteney, 1st Earl of Bath, Secretary at War, General Lumley, General Earl and Sir Philip Meadows, Controller of the Army and Knight Marshal of the King's Palace, whose daughter, Mary Meadows, was made of honour to Walpole's friend, Queen Caroline. A keen huntsman, Walpole built for himself Great Lodge in Richmond Park. Philip Meadows, the deputy ranger of the park and son of Walpole's political ally, Sir Philip Meadows, lived at Great Lodge after Walpole had vacated it. Dot in his new political positions, and encouraged by his advisers, Walpole introduced the sinking fund, a device to reduce the national debt. The cabinet of which he was a member was often divided over most important issues. Normally, Walpole and Lord Townsend were on one side, with Stanhope and Lord Sunderland on the other. Foreign policy was the primary issue of contention, George I was thought to be conducting foreign affairs with the interests of his German territories, rather than those of Great Britain, at heart. The Stanhope-Sunderland faction, however, had the King's support. In 1716 Townsend had been removed from the important post of Northern Secretary and put in the lesser office of Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. 
Even this change did not appease Stanhope and Sunderland, who secured the dismissal of Townsend from the Lord Lieutenancy in April 1717. On the next day, Walpole resigned from the cabinet to join the opposition because I could not connive at some things that were carrying on, and by joining the opposition he did not intend to make the king uneasy or to embarrass his affairs. This began the Whig split, dividing the dominant party for three years. In the new cabinet, Sunderland and Stanhope were the effective heads. Soon after Walpole's resignation, a bitter family quarrel between the King and the Prince of Wales split the royal family. Walpole and others who opposed the government often congregated at Leicester House, the home of the Prince of Wales, to form political plans. Walpole also became an adviser and close friend of the Prince of Wales's wife, Caroline. In 1720 he improved his position by bringing about a reconciliation between the Prince of Wales and the King. Walpole continued to be an influential figure in the House of Commons. He was especially active in opposing one of the government's more significant proposals, the Peerage Bill, which would have limited the power of the monarch to create new peerages. Walpole brought about a temporary abandonment of the bill in 1719 and the outright rejection of the bill by the House of Commons. This defeat led Lord Stanhope and Lord Sunderland to reconcile with their opponents. Walpole returned as paymaster of the forces and Townsend was appointed Lord President of the Council. By accepting the position of paymaster, however, Walpole lost the favour of the Prince of Wales, who still harboured disdain for his father's government. Chapter 5 Rise to Power Soon after Walpole returned to the cabinet, Britain was swept by a wave of over-enthusiastic speculation which led to the South Sea bubble. The government had established a plan whereby the South Sea Company would assume the national debt of Great Britain in exchange for lucrative bonds. It was widely believed that the company would eventually reap an enormous profit through international trade in cloth, agricultural goods, and slaves. Many in the country, including Walpole himself, frenziedly invested in the company. By the latter part of 1720, however, the company had begun to collapse as the price of its shares plunged. In 1721 a committee investigated the scandal, finding that there was corruption on the part of many in the cabinet. Among those implicated were John Aislaby, James Craggs the Elder, James Craggs the Younger, and even Lord Stanhope and Sunderland. Both Craggs the Elder and Craggs the Younger died in disgrace, the remainder were impeached for their corruption. Aislaby was found guilty and imprisoned, but the personal influence of Walpole saved both Stanhope and Sunderland. For his role in preventing these individuals and others from being punished, Walpole gained the nickname of the Screen, or Screen Master General. The resignation of Sunderland, and the death of Stanhope in 1721 left Walpole as the most important figure in the administration. In April 1721 he was appointed First Lord of the Treasury, Chancellor of the Exchequer and Leader of the House of Commons. Walpole's de facto tenure as Prime Minister is often dated to his appointment as First Lord of the Treasury in 1721, though he himself rejected that title, stating in 1741, I unequivocally deny that I am sole and Prime Minister. His brother-in-law Lord Townsend served as Secretary of State for the Northern Department, and controlled the nation's foreign affairs. The two also had to contend with the Secretary of State for the Southern Department, Lord Carteret. Townsend and Walpole were thus restored to power and annihilated the opposing faction. Chapter 6 Premiership under George I under the guidance of Walpole, Parliament attempted to deal with the financial crisis brought on by the South Sea bubble. The estates of the directors of the South Sea Company were used, to relieve the suffering of the victims, and the stock of the company was divided between the Bank of England, and East India Company. The crisis had gravely damaged the credibility of the King and of the Whig Party, but Walpole defended both with skillful oratory in the House of Commons. Walpole's first year as Prime Minister was also marked by the discovery of a plot formed by Francis Atterbury, the Bishop of Rochester. The exposure of the scheme crushed the hopes of the Jacobites whose previous attempts at rebellion had also failed. 
The Tory party was equally unfortunate even though Lord Bolingbroke, a Tory leader who fled to France to avoid punishment for his Jacobite sympathies, was permitted to return to Britain in 1723. During the remainder of George I's reign, Walpole's ascendancy continued, the political power of the monarch was gradually diminishing, and that of his ministers gradually increasing. In 1724 the primary political rival of Walpole and Townsend in the cabinet, Lord Carteret, was dismissed from the post of Southern Secretary and once again appointed to the lesser office of Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. In Ireland, Lord Carteret used his power to secretly aid in the controversy over Wood's Hapence and support Drapier's letters behind the scenes and cause harm to Walpole's power. Walpole was able to recover from these events by removing the patent. However, Irish sentiment was situated against the English control. Townsend, working with the King, helped keep Great Britain at peace, especially by negotiating a treaty with France and Prussia in 1725. Walpole was not consulted and stated that Townsend was too precipitate in his actions. Great Britain, free from Jacobite threats, from war, and from financial crises, grew prosperous, and Robert Walpole acquired the favour of George I. In 1725 he persuaded the King to revive the knighthood of the Bath and was himself invested with the Order, and in 1726 was made a Knight of the Garter, earning him the nickname Sir Blue String. His eldest son was granted a barony. Chapter 7, Premiership under George II Walpole's position was threatened in 1727 when George I died and was succeeded by George II. For a few days it seemed that Walpole would be dismissed but, on the advice of Queen Caroline, the King agreed to keep him in office. Although the King disliked Townsend, he retained him as well. Over the next years Walpole continued to share power with Townsend but the two clashed over British foreign affairs, especially over policy regarding Austria. Gradually Walpole became the clearly dominant partner in government. His colleague retired on 15 May 1730 and this date is sometimes given as the beginning of Walpole's unofficial tenure as Prime Minister. Townsend's departure enabled Walpole to conclude the Treaty of Vienna, creating the Anglo-Austrian alliance. Chapter 8 Section 1 Opposition Walpole, a polarizing figure, had many opponents, the most important of whom were in the country party, such as Lord Bolingbroke and William Pulteney. Bolingbroke and Pulteney ran a periodical called The Craftsman, in which they incessantly denounced the Prime Minister's policies. Walpole was also satirized and parodied extensively, he was often compared to the criminal Jonathan Wilde as, for example, John Gay did in his farcical Beggar's Opera. Walpole's other enemies included Jonathan Swift, Alexander Pope, Henry Fielding, and Samuel Johnson. Chapter 8 Section 2 – Support Walpole secured the support of the people and of the House of Commons with a policy of avoiding war. He used his influence to prevent George II from entering the War of the Polish Succession in 1733, because it was a dispute between the Bourbons and the Habsburgs. He boasted, there are 50,000 men slain in Europe this year, and not one Englishman. By avoiding wars, Walpole could lower taxes. He reduced the national debt with a sinking fund, and by negotiating lower interest rates. He reduced the land tax from four shillings in 1721, to threes in 1728, twos in 1731 and finally to only ones in 1732. His long-term goal was to replace the land tax, which was paid by the local gentry, with excise and customs taxes, which were paid by merchants and ultimately by consumers. Walpole joked that the landed gentry resembled hogs, which squealed loudly whenever anyone laid hands on him. By contrast, he said, merchants were like sheep, and yielded their wool without complaint. The joke backfired in 1733 when he was defeated in a major battle to impose excise taxes on wine and tobacco. To reduce the threat of smuggling, the tax was to be collected not at ports but at warehouses. This new proposal, however, was extremely unpopular and aroused the opposition of the nation's merchants. 
Walpole agreed to withdraw the bill before Parliament voted on it, but he dismissed the politicians who had dared to oppose it in the first place. Thus, Walpole lost a considerable element of his Whig party to the opposition. After the general elections of 1734, Walpole's supporters still formed a majority in the House of Commons although they were less numerous than before. He maintained both his parliamentary supremacy and his popularity in Norfolk, his home county. In May 1734, he presented a new silver mace weighing 168 ounces, gilt and finely exchased, to the city of Norwich, on the cup part of it are Sir Robert's arms, and the arms of the city, it was first carried before Mayor Philip Meadows Esquire on the 29th of May. However, despite these great occasions, Walpole's broader popularity had begun to wane. In 1736 an increase in the tax on gin inspired riots in London. The even more serious Porteous riots broke out in Edinburgh after the King pardoned a captain of the guard who had commanded his troops to shoot a group of protesters. Though these events diminished Walpole's popularity, they failed to shake his majority in Parliament. Walpole's domination over the House of Commons was highlighted by the ease with which he secured the rejection of Sir John Barnard's plan to reduce the interest on the national debt. Walpole was also able to persuade Parliament to pass the Licensing Act of 1737 under which London theatres were regulated. The Act revealed a disdain for Swift, Pope, Fielding, and other literary figures who had attacked his government in their works. While the Country Party attacked Walpole relentlessly, he subsidized writers and lesser known journalists such as William Arnold and Bishop Benjamin Hoadley, as well as two men he named, to the role of poet laureate, Lawrence Eusden and Collie Kibber. They defended Walpole from the charge of evil political corruption by arguing that corruption is the universal human condition. Furthermore, they argued, Political divisiveness was also universal, and inevitable because of selfish passions that were integral to human nature. Arnold argued that government must be strong enough to control conflict, and in that regard Walpole was quite successful. This style of court political rhetoric continued through the 18th century. Chapter 8 Decline the year 1737 saw the death of Walpole's close friend Queen Caroline. Though her death did not end his personal influence with George II, who had grown loyal to the Prime Minister during the preceding years, Walpole's domination of government continued to decline. His opponents acquired a vocal leader in the Prince of Wales who was estranged from his father, the King. Several young politicians including William Pitt the Elder and George Grenville formed a faction known as the Patriot Boys and joined the Prince of Wales in opposition. Walpole's failure to maintain a policy of avoiding military conflict eventually led to his fall from power. Under the Treaty of Seville, Great Britain agreed not to trade with the Spanish colonies in North America. Spain claimed the right to board and search British vessels to ensure compliance with this provision. Disputes however, broke out over trade with the West Indies. Walpole attempted to prevent war, but was opposed by the King, the House of Commons, and by a faction in his own cabinet. In 1739 Walpole abandoned all efforts to stop the conflict and commenced the War of Jenkins' Ear. Walpole's influence continued to dramatically decline even after the war began. In the 1741 general election his supporters secured an increase in votes in constituencies that were decided by mass electorates but failed to win in many pocket boroughs. In general the government made gains in England and Wales but this was not enough to overturn the reverses of the 1734 election and further losses in Cornwall where many constituencies were obedient to the will of the Prince of Wales. These constituencies returned members of Parliament hostile to the Prime Minister. Similarly, the influence of the Duke of Argyle secured the election of members opposed to Walpole in some parts of Scotland. Walpole's new majority was difficult to determine because of the uncertain loyalties of many new members, but contemporaries and historians estimated it as low as 14 to 18. In the new Parliament, many Whigs thought the aging Prime Minister incapable of leading the military campaign. Moreover, his majority was not as strong as it had formerly been, his detractors, such as William Pulteney, Earl of Bath, and Lord Percival, 
being approximately as numerous as his supporters. Behind these political enemies were opposition Whigs, Tories, and Jacobites. Walpole was alleged to have presided over an immense increase in corruption, and to have enriched himself enormously whilst in office. Parliamentary committees were formed to investigate these charges. In 1742 when the House of Commons was prepared to determine the validity of a by-election in Chippenham, Walpole and others agreed to treat the issue as a motion of no confidence. As Walpole was defeated on the vote, he agreed to resign from the government. The news of the naval disaster against Spain in the Battle of Cartagena de Indias also prompted the end of his political career. King George II wept on his resignation and begged to see him frequently. As part of his resignation the king agreed to elevate him to the House of Lords as the Earl of Orford, Viscount Walpole and Baron Walpole of Houghton in the county of Norfolk, this occurred on 6 February 1742. Five days later he formally relinquished the seals of office. Although no longer First Lord of the Treasury, Walpole remained politically involved as an advisor. His former colleagues were still pleased to see him, perhaps in part because he retained the king's favour. After his resignation, his main political roles were to support the government by means of advice, to dole out some patronage and to speak on the ministry's behalf in the Lords. Chapter 9 Later Years Lord Orford was succeeded as Prime Minister by Lord Wilmington in an administration whose true head was Lord Carteret. A committee was created to inquire into Walpole's ministry but no substantial evidence of wrongdoing or corruption was discovered. Though no longer a member of the cabinet, Orford continued to maintain personal influence with George II and was often dubbed the minister behind the curtain for this advice and influence. In 1744 he managed to secure the dismissal of Carteret and the appointment of Henry Pelham whom he regarded as a political protégé. He advised Pelham to make use of his seat in the Commons to serve as a bridge between the King and Parliament, just as Walpole had done dot during this time, Walpole also made two interventions in the Lords. The first was in January 1744 in the debate on Hanoverian troops being kept in British pay. Walpole prevented them from losing the troops. In his second intervention, Walpole, with fear of a Jacobite-inspired invasion in February 1744, made a speech on the situation. Frederick, Prince of Wales, usually hostile to Walpole, warmly received him at his court the next day, most likely because his father's throne, and the future of the whole Hanoverian dynasty, was at risk from the Stuart pretender. Along with his political interests in his last years, Walpole enjoyed the pleasures of the hunt. Back at his recently rebuilt country seat in Houghton, Norfolk, such pastimes were denied him due to dismal weather. He also enjoyed the beauties of the countryside. His art collection gave him particular pleasure. He had spent much money in the 1720s and 1730s in building up a collection of old masters from all over Europe. Walpole also concerned himself with estate matters. His health, never good, deteriorated rapidly toward the end of 1744, Orford died in London in 1745, aged nearly 69 years, he was buried in the parish church of St. Martin in Houghton, Norfolk. His earldom passed to his eldest son Robert who was in turn succeeded by his only son George. Upon the death of the third earl, the earldom was inherited by the first earl's younger son Horace Walpole, who is now remembered for his many thousands of insightful letters, published in 48 volumes by Yale University Press. Chapter 10 Legacy Walpole exercised a tremendous influence on the politics of his day. The Tories became a minor, insignificant faction, and the Whigs became a dominant, and largely unopposed party. His influence on the development of the uncodified constitution of Great Britain was less momentous even though he is regarded as Great Britain's first Prime Minister. He relied primarily on the favour of the King rather than on the support of the House of Commons. His power stemmed from his personal influence instead of the influence of his office. Most of his immediate successors were, comparatively speaking, extremely weak, it would take several decades more for the premiership to develop into the most powerful, 
and most important office in the country. Walpole's strategy of keeping Great Britain at peace contributed greatly to the country's prosperity. Walpole also managed to secure the position of the Hanoverian dynasty and effectively countervailed Jacobitism. The Jacobite threat ended soon after Walpole's term ended with the defeat of the rebellion of 1745. Later in the century, the Whig MP Edmund Burke admitted him into the Whig pantheon. Burke wrote, He was an honorable man and a sound Whig. He was not, as the Jacobites and discontented Whigs of his time have represented him, and as ill-informed people still represent him, a prodigal and corrupt minister. They charged him in their libels and seditious conversations as having first reduced corruption to a system. Such was their cant. But he was far from governing by corruption. He governed by party attachments. The charge of systematic corruption is less applicable to him, perhaps, than to any minister who ever served the crown for so great a length of time. He gained over very few from the opposition. Without being a genius of the first class, he was an intelligent, prudent, and safe minister. He loved peace, and he helped to communicate the same disposition to nations at least as warlike and restless as that in which he had the chief direction of affairs, with many virtues, public and private, he had his faults, but his faults were superficial. A careless, coarse, and over-familiar style of discourse, without sufficient regard to persons or occasions, and an almost total want of political decorum, were the errors by which he was most hurt in the public opinion, and those through which his enemies obtained the greatest advantage over him. But justice must be done. The prudence, steadiness, and vigilance of that man, joined to the greatest possible lenity in his character and his politics, preserved the crown to this royal family, and with it, their laws and liberties to this country. Lord Chesterfield expressed skepticism as to whether an impartial character of S. R. Robert Walpole, will or can be transmitted to posterity, for he governed this kingdom so long that the various passions of mankind mingled, and in a manner incorporated themselves, with everything that was said or writ concerning him. Never was man more flattered nor more abused, and his long power, was probably the chief cause of both. Chesterfield claimed he was much acquainted with him both in his public and his private life. In private life he was good-natured, cheerful, social. Inelegant in his manners, loose in his morals. He had a coarse wit, which he was too free of for a man in his station, as it is always inconsistent with dignity. He was very able as a minister, but without a certain elevation of mind, he was both the ablest parliament man, and the ablest manager of a parliament, that I believe ever lived, money, not prerogative, was the chief engine of his administration, and he employed it with a success that in a manner disgraced humanity, when he found any body proof, against pecuniary temptations, which alas, was but seldom, he had recourse to still a worse art. For he laughed at and ridiculed all notions of public virtue, and the love of one's country, calling them the chimerical schoolboy flights of classical learning, declaring himself at the same time, no saint, no Spartan, no reformer. He would frequently ask young fellows at their first appearance in the world, while their honest hearts were yet untainted, well are you to be an old Roman. A patriot. You will soon come off of that, and grow wiser. And thus he was more dangerous to the morals, than to the liberties of his country, to which I am persuaded that he mean no ill in his heart, his name will not be recorded in history among the best men, or the best ministers, but much much less ought it to be ranked among the worst. 10 Downing Street represents another part of Walpole's legacy. George II offered this home to Walpole as a personal gift in 1732, but Walpole accepted it only as the official residence of the First Lord of the Treasury, taking up his residence there on the 22nd of September 1735. His immediate successors did not always reside in No. 10 but the home has nevertheless become established as the official residence of the Prime Minister. Walpole has attracted attention from heterodox economists as a pioneer of protectionist policies, in the form of tariffs and subsidies to woolen manufacturers. As a result, the industry became Britain's primary export, 
enabling the country to import the raw materials and food that fueled the Industrial Revolution. Walpole is immortalized in St. Stephen's Hall, where he and other notable parliamentarians look on at visitors to Parliament. Walpole built Houghton Hall in Norfolk as his country seat. He also left behind a collection of art which he had assembled during his career. His grandson, the third Earl of Orford, sold many of the works in this collection to the Russian Empress Catherine II in 1779. This collection, then regarded as one of the finest in Europe, now lies in the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. In 2013 the Hermitage loaned the collection to Houghton for display following the original William Kent hanging plan, recently discovered at Houghton. The nursery rhyme who killed Cock Robin. May allude to the fall of Walpole, who carried the popular nickname Cock Robin. In the United States, the towns of Walpole, Massachusetts, and Orford, New Hampshire, take their respective names from Sir Robert Walpole, Earl of Orford. Walpole Street in Wolverhampton is named after Sir Robert Walpole. Walpole Island, named for Sir Robert Walpole, comprises an island and an Indian reserve in southwestern Ontario, Canada, on the border between Ontario and Michigan. It lies at the mouth of the St. Clair River on Lake St. Clair, approximately 30 miles northeast of Detroit, Michigan, and of Windsor, Ontario. Chapter 11, Marriage and Children Chapter 12 Section 1, Catherine Shorter On 30 July 1700, Walpole married Catherine, daughter of John Shorter of Bybrook in Ashford, Kent. She was described as a woman of exquisite beauty and accomplished manners. Her £20,000 dowry was, according to her brother-in-law Horatio Walpole, spent on the wedding, christenings and jewels. Together they had two daughters and three sons. Robert who married Margaret Roll, later the 15th Baroness Clinton, in 1724. They had one son, George, who died unmarried. Catherine, who died unmarried and without issue. Mary, who married George Cholmondeley, 3rd Earl of Cholmondeley, on 14 September 1723. They had sons and daughters. She died at Aix-en-Provence in 1731, and was buried at Malpas, Cheshire. Edward who died unmarried but had four illegitimate children with Dorothy Clement, three of whom were daughters. Laura, the eldest, married Bishop Frederick Keppel. The second daughter, Maria Walpole, married, firstly, James Waldegrave, second Earl Waldegrave and, secondly, Prince William Henry, Duke of Gloucester and Edinburgh, King George III's brother. His son, Edward, born in 1737, died in 1771 without issue. The youngest daughter, Charlotte, was wife of Lionel Tolmash, 5th Earl of Dysart. Horace, who died unmarried and without issue Walpole's first wife Catherine died on 20 August 1737, and was buried in Henry VII Chapel, Westminster Abbey. Chapter 12 Section 2, Maria Skerritt Prior to the death of his first wife, Walpole took on a mistress, Maria, daughter of Thomas Skerritt. She was a fashionable socialite of wit and beauty, with an independent fortune of £30,000. Walpole had married her by March 1738. They had been living openly together in Richmond Park and Houghton Hall before 1728. Maria had borne him a daughter, also called Maria, who was no longer illegitimate after her parents' marriage and, as the daughter of an earl, became Lady Maria Walpole. In 1746, this daughter married Colonel Charles Churchill of Chalfant, illegitimate son of General Charles Churchill and became the housekeeper of Windsor Castle. Their daughter Mary became the second wife of Charles Cadogan, 1st Earl Cadogan, and had issue. His second wife died following a miscarriage on 4 June 1739. Walpole considered her indispensable to his happiness, and her loss plunged him into a deplorable and comfortless condition, which ended in a severe illness. Chapter 12 Section 3, Sources Chapter 12 Section 4, Primary Sources Cox, William. 
Memoirs of the Life and Administration of Sir Robert Walpole, Earl of Orford Online.